Hello again. It seems like every day there's another headline about election law and voting access. Proponents say that these are all an effort to minimize voting fraud, but opponents of some of these measures say these moves are intended to make voting more difficult to suppress voting in some communities. Here with me to discuss what to do about this, we have Lori Agino. She's executive director of the National Vote at Home Institute. Also with us, Grace Martinez Rosas, executive director of United We Dream, and Latasha Brown, co-founder of Black Voters Matter. Great to have you all with us. Latasha, I'd like to start with you if I could. When it comes to voting access, are you alarmed by what you're seeing in Congress, in state legislatures, from the Supreme Court? Are all lights flashing red for you? Oh, absolutely. I think that everybody should be alarmed. You know, what we're seeing right now is a total attack on democracy to unravel the democratic systems that we have in place. And we still don't have the full infrastructure that we need to actually have pluralism um, in this nation. But what is happening right now, and I think the boundaries are being tested every single day. There's always been a strategy that has been used to actually undermine voting rights in this country. There's been three parts. The first part has been around restricting access to the ballot, creating additional barriers to make it harder for people to vote. The second issue has been literally weaponizing administrative process, legalizing efforts and activities that say, well, it's legal, but it also becomes another barrier in itself. And then third piece has been creating a culture of fear. And so that's what we're seeing right now. We're seeing all of those on multiple levels, on the state level and on federal level, happen um, on a massive scale to actually be able to undermine the voting power of of voting power of, of people in this nation. And so alarms, the alarms have been ringing for a while, but the alarms, we're here. We're here in this moment. It's a defining moment around the, the, the future of this democracy. Grace, do you agree with that? Absolutely. Um, I mean, I, I'll follow Latasha wherever she goes. And when she says there's smoke, there's fire. And so I'm, you know, I'm clear that um, from the fight for women to gain access to uh, voting, from the work of courageous leadership of Black people from the South in this country to demand voting rights. And in this moment, when you see people like Latasha, like the members of United We Dream that are undocumented young people that have grown up in this country and yet do not have, after 35 years, the access to voting for our representatives, it is a challenge for all of us and it's affecting all of us. But the beauty of this moment is that we are not without recourse. We are not without power. And nationwide, we've seen a multiracial uh, coalition of groups led by Black women like Latasha and many others that have said, this is the moment, this is our time, and brought our elected officials' feet to the fire. And so we've seen um, the power of organizing. Just in 2021, New York State restored the rights of um, people that could um, that were formerly incarcerated to vote in Florida. We've seen efforts to do this. And so we are ready to meet this moment in this emergency. Lori, mail-in voting is being curbed in some states and opponents say it's fraught with risk. First, tell us, is it fraught with risk? No, absolutely not. And I think voters across this country in 2020 relied on mail-in voting so that they could participate and that they could do so safely and securely. And uh, seeing that some states are making it harder to um, to access the, the most fundamental right um, is just beyond disheartening. Um, every voter should have the ability to request a mail-in ballot. In fact, I mean, if we had it our way, every voter would automatically be mailed a ballot for every election. But, um, you know, requiring excuses or putting uh, burdensome uh, requirements in place just to access that ballot. And then, you know, seeing what is happening uh, in some states now where there are additional requirements that you have to meet to, to just apply and then to have your ballot counted, um, just really disheartening. And at the end of the day, uh, a mail-in ballot uh, with plenty of opportunities to return that ballot should be the norm and um, certainly shouldn't require an excuse. Lori, if that's the case, why do you think it's facing such opposition in some places? I think um, that the former president most definitely um, made put an attack on mail-in voting or um, a mailed out ballot system. And um, others have kind of latched onto that and, and believe that to be true. But at the end of the day, 
uh, these mailed out ballot systems have been in use in red states and in blue states. They are voter centric solutions that provide voters the, oppor uh, the opportunity and every ability to participate safely and securely. So um, they are good for all voters, regardless of your party. And um, it, it should be a system that is accessible to all. Grace, as you look forward to the midterm elections, what are the greatest challenges you're facing? That's a great question. I, I think that one of the greatest challenges that our community is facing is racialized disinformation. It's an existential threat to the lives of black and brown people, young people, immigrants, Latinos, like the ones that I represent. We've seen its effects when it comes to the COVID vaccine. It's cost us lives. And now um, those that would have us be pushed out of the voting rolls, those that would have us live in the shadows are using disinformation and misinformation in our communities to disenfranchise us. You know, everything from driving false narratives about candidates, um, like, or telling uh, falsehoods about our immigrants and our role in this democracy. I think that our grassroots movements though are responding resoundingly and being able to take responsibility as the truth tellers, the light carriers that are saying to our community, this is the information, these are the trusted sources. But I think that it's gonna take a lot more of support of our grassroots efforts to ensure that we are combating racialized disinformation that includes advancements in technologies that are led by um, black and brown people queer people, Latinos, it's going to take real effort and real courage from our elected officials and accountability to corporations like Facebook and others that drive these narratives that harm our communities. Mm -hmm. uh, Latasha, are you also seeing this racialized disinformation and what impact is it having? Is it discouraging people, do you think, from wanting to participate in democracy? You know, I think it's a spectrum of how people are responding to it. I think that there are certainly people, I think what we do know is it's creating confusion, right? But I think that there are some people who are drawing a line in the sand, they see it, they're getting frustrated and they're activated. There are others that are actually following kind of the same line of thinking and the danger of it is because it, ultimately, the, I think the, 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 the worst part of it is that it creates confusion, right? And so people really don't know what information to be able to discern what's real and not real. But I want to build on something that Gracia said, and I think both she and Laurie talked about it. You know, we're talking about kind of these elements of what's happening at voter suppression. That's the conversation or what's happening around the attack on the vote. You would just, you pretty much would have to be in a coma at this point if you're not seeing that the vote is under attack. And so while I think that that's kind of the framing of a conversation that we need to have in this nation, a larger conversation in this nation is that we need to talk about if we really want America to be a true democracy. The truth of the matter is democracy as it's been laid out in the constitution, we've never had the full franchisement of citizens in this nation, right? And so that it is a, it's a moment right now that we're really being able to define if we're going to continue to grow as a nation where there's mass inequities, where there are few people who benefit from the work of the rest of us, if we're going to continue to go as a, as a nation that when people vote, they're punished for how they voted and who they voted for. Like, will democracy just be a pro propaganda piece that we spread around the world? Or will democracy be a principle that we're literally mm -hmm. anchoring all of our systems in? And I do think, and I, I'm raising that because I don't see the kind of response that is operating like this is an emergency. We're seeing the flashing lights, but it's almost like it's the neighbor that's just peeping out the window and saying, oh, wow, what, what happened over there? No, your own house is on fire. Uh, Latasha, there's a lot to unpack there. I want to I want to center on one part of it, which is information. Lori, you have been an election official. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that strikes me is that the rules are changing, changing, changing. Uh, it seems with great rapidity. How hard do you think it's going to be for voters and for organizations like all of yours to get good information into the hands of voters so they know where to do, where to go and what to do in order to have their vote count? That is absolutely the biggest challenge that we have right now, because you tune into national media every day and there is discussion about what the rules are in any given state. And that is so hard for any individual voter to know, okay, what what does that mean for me? Can I, can I, am I going to get my ballot automatically? Can I, uh, can I, you know, where, where am I supposed to go? What are the rules? And so I think that is um, the biggest challenge for individual voters, the biggest challenge for elections officials, the biggest challenge for grassroots organizers uh, to know what the rules are, to ensure that they're communicating the accurate rules, because the last thing anyone wants to do that is doing this, uh, that is really, you know, 
talking about the process and doing so in a way where they want to actually spread accurate information. Um, so getting the rules right and then um, ensuring, I think, that voters are connecting with their local election official to really understand what the rules are and do that now. Have a plan for how you are going to vote, how you are going to participate and do that analysis now. And you know what? Because legislatures are in session right now and changing the rules uh, that may even apply to 2022, identifying what that rule is now, making sure that you're prepared and have a plan for casting your vote this year. Lori, let me just follow up on this for a moment. There has been a lot of discussion about how uh, election positions are being filled with partisans. Can people trust the information that they're going to be getting from local election officials? I hope so. If you can't trust your local elections office, uh, I mean, we've got bigger problems. Um, I think that what I would recommend is, you know, voters contacting their local election office, going to visit the election office, observe the process. These are folks that are at, you know, the hyper local level representing you and um, and and um, delivering democracy for the voters either in that township or in that county. So go to that office. Uh, understand what the rules are, and again, have that plan to participate. And I always encourage election observation um, because that can help. That can help voters understand what the process is and be more educated so that they can share accurate information. Grace, uh, the forces that are trying to undermine voting rights are very well funded. Do you find yourself totally outgunned? Hmm. Well, what I know to be true is that any victories that have had um, moved this uh, this country forward have been a result of grassroots organizing. And so when we look at the resources that the far right is expanding or spending in this moment, you know, it's easy to feel small. But when I look at the power of organizing, when I look at the work that people in Arizona, like our affiliates, United We Dream Members of Utah, have done to change the tide in the state, when I've looked at what's been happening in Georgia, um, and, you know, Latasha is like the, the person on this panel that can talk more about that, I am reminded about the power of organizing. But what is true and what is important is that it matters that we have access to the vote. It matters that people that are able to vote are doing so. And it also matters that everyone sees themselves in this fight. The reality is that I'm undocumented. I don't have the ability to vote. My access to democracy is limited. But that means that I have even more of a responsibility to support the efforts to ensure that our democracy is available for all of us. Because this isn't really about just getting being able to pick some, I don't know really what happens in the voting booth, but like I imagine there's a computer or something that you put in there, but it's more than just that. It's about the lives of the members of United We Dream. It's about the ability for a young kid like myself growing up in Texas to have access to education and books and food. It is about this larger conversation that we're having in this country about who belongs. And it is more than just about bridging a gap and ensuring that people on both sides are able to talk to one another. We have to win the argument that this democracy belongs to all of us, that are documented people, Black people, women, queer young people like myself belonging it and we're not going we're not going to back down. We're going to hold our elected officials to make that a reality for all of us. Latasha, your organization is Black Voters Matter. In this moment, is it going to be hard to mobilize Black voters or are they somewhat discouraged by what's been happening or not happening on the national scene? You know, that's a really excellent question because I think we're finding a little bit of everything. I think we're finding people are actually are frustrated. They're frustrated for a number of reasons. They're frustrated um, that when you look at the things that Black voters made key and central uh, for them in the last election cycle, the presidential election cycle, were criminal justice reform. We still have not achieved criminal justice reform. They really wanted to make sure that there was an issue around dealing with, with racial progress. We've not seen um, the, at the level and the scale that, that I think people wanted. I don't think watching the incident of how the Haitians were treated opposed to 
um, how we've seen other immigrants be treated um, has also fed into this narrative of anti-Blackness. And then I think the third thing is voting rights. Many people that I talked to thought that should be a slam dunk. You know, we understand the nuances, but we also recognize that there is a growing frustration in the community. What I do believe though, and I think Georgia can be instructive to that, in 2018, we were extremely frustrated in the governor's race that happened there where many people felt like Stacey Abrams and Brian Kemp, who, were, who is the current governor, were running, um, that that race had been stolen from her as he had used his office, he had abused his office as Secretary of State to take out hundreds of thousands of voters. And many people thought that folks would be so frustrated that they would actually disengage. Well, because of the work of grassroots organizations on the ground to actually educate people and to actually bring folks in the fold and expand it, what we saw is we saw that energy of anger, anger be transformed into a, a, a energy of activation. And I think we're going to have to do that too. I think we're going to have to literally, this. I've said this from day one, there are some things that to put the burden for us to out-organize it's like, can you out organize an oppression? Well, you know, that is there are elements of it, but the bottom line is oppression creates barriers oftentimes and walls oftentimes that they're just too enormous for us to try to jump or even for us to really be able to make the kind of progress. So what I do believe is I do believe there has to be a narrative shift, something that 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 Grace has said earlier. Um, I think it was Lori who, who shared around um, kind of this narrative that we've got to shift this story around that it's not just about what is happening to individual Black voters. I would be the first to say that the impetus of this was focused and targeted on Black voters. But there has to be an understanding that the entire uh, foundation of democracy is being shaken when any time that there are a group of people that can be targeted and punished because they participated, that that is how democracies die all around. That is how fascism comes into power. And so there has to be a greater and a broader understanding of what that is and I do think that in this moment, it is also a time for us to really be able to think about the structural changes that need to be made. When we're looking at D.C., why is it that there's 700,000 people in D.C. that have taxation without representation? You hey, know, that's why? me. Right, right. <laughs> like, why is that? Why is that acceptable to, to, to us? So we've got to get serious about this democracy thing. Instead of democracy just being this element of propaganda and convenience, it has to be real and it has to be aligned with structural change that is going to lead itself to supporting the kind of citizens that we have representat representative um, democracy in this nation. And we're not there yet, but believe it or not, I actually believe this is the closest of the opportunity we ever had to get there because people are really looking at the structural issues in ways that they've not looked at before. Uh, Lori, we have a question from the audience directed at you. This is from a Corbell student who asked, do you think grassroots efforts have been more or less successful promoting democracy specifically when compared with other topical issues like climate change? And if so, why might that be? I, you know, I think I, I kind of I, I want to take that question and then use Lata what Latasha said to follow up on that. I think that this is a moment um, where these grassroots efforts can really be effective in mobilizing uh, folks to participate. So take what you have, uh, take the moment that we are in right now and use this as an opportunity to rather than, um, you know, definitely keep keep fighting against those kinds of changes that make it harder for voters to participate. But um, but but use that as a means for ensuring that voters participate. Determine what these rules are in each state in your area, uh, working with those local election offices to ensure that you know what the rules are and that they're accurate, and then mobilize working with those trusted, uh, be a trusted voice and working with voters in your community to ensure that they can participate no matter what the rules are. Um, and so taking those opportunities now um, in this moment, um, I think could be incredibly effective um, if, if, um, if we can not only work to improve the system uh, and we think uh, the vote at home, full vote at home system is really the answer, um, but, but regardless, take 2022 to mobilize efforts around ensuring uh, voters know the rules and ensuring that they participate. Uh, Grace, so we have another question. This one is for you. Is it possible for the government to support or work in tandem with successful grassroots campaigns? 
Absolutely. I think that we've seen um, the ability for a, a government that works for the people. When we see policies like deferred action for childhood arrivals, the, this protection that I and million, uh, nearly 700,000 undocumented people demanded with a grassroots effort and made real with um, some government support. I think that what we are seeing in states like New York that just passed um, voting rights for non-citizens, um, I think is one example in which local governments are leading the way and what could be possible. We are seeing um, across the country uh, efforts to ensure that um, undocumented people, uh, Black folks, young people have access to the much needed COVID relief. So absolutely, I wouldn't be doing my job correctly or this work if I didn't believe that to be possible. And a true and healthy democracy welcomes um, uh, dissent, welcomes the ability to be better and welcomes the ability to work, to be, to, to strive to include all of us. The reality is, Jean and everyone watching that, I represent undocumented people, 11 million undocumented people that have been in this country and have been de demanding protection for more than 35 years. All we want is citizenship. All we want is the ability to be able to drive home to our kids and deliver food that like is fair. Um, and in this moment, what we've seen that this Congress and Democrats that have been elected to represent us have failed to deliver not only for 11 million undocumented people, but in the voting rights conversation that Latasha was talking about and many other ways. And so it is up to us, it is up to young people, people that are courageous and visionary to make this government work for all of us. You mentioned documentation that relates to another audience question. This one coming from Billy in Denver. One emphasis nowadays is on requiring ID from every voter. As a former Arizonan, I worry about the Native American elders who don't have such documents and already have been shut out of some elections. How can they be accommodated? Uh, Grace, uh, Lori, do either of you have thoughts or, or Latasha? I would love Grace. I know Grace has done a lot of work with indigenous communities. So. Grace, well, I'll, I'll say that uh, there's the Native or, uh, Organizing Alliance that has been uh, spearheading works in, um, in places all across the country uh, to ensure that Native American and their, and their growing political power continues to be leveraged. Um, I think Judith LeBlanc and many others have been leading the way. But what's important is that documentation is another way in which racialized disinformation and racialized disenfranchisement happens all across our communities, including um, uh, black and brown people, Latinos and indigenous folks. And so yes, they are right to be concerned. We, uh, we are right to be um, in action, but uh, we don't just agonize, we organize as good organizers say. And so if you want to do something about it, join the efforts of Native or, um, Organizing Alliances and you'll be, you'll be set. Latasha, do you want to chime in on this? Yeah, you know, question? just one, one thing just to add to that. You know, I, I want people to think about it. You know, it is easier for me to move $50,000 than it is for me to go vote. Like, why is that? I can pick up my cell phone right now and move money anywhere around the world, right? How is it that we can create a system that is so secure that we can move, me move capital within seconds, but we have this long, arduous process that one is not standardized around the country, that we have to have all of these extra pieces in something that is supposed to be in a hyper value that clearly this nation doesn't value, right? And so I'm raising this, that something, now what, what America has been really clear as a capitalist society is that it values money. So how that which you value, you have found ways to make it convenient and accessible, but something else we have, that's because it is an intentional effort, whether it's it's almost death by a thousand cuts. It is we shave off a few with voter ID. We shave off a few by po sh shutting polling sites. We shave off a few by having rejection of mail-in ballots where a study came out just this week that said Black voters, their mail-in ballots are rejected four times of their white counterparts. My point is that we have to acknowledge that there is a concerted effort to undermine and engage and make the process as small as possible 
so that only a few would be controlling the resources of the, of, of the many. In addition to that, we also have to shift from looking at this as just in this legal framework or this electoral framework, we have to see this as a human rights issue, that every single human being should have the right to have influence on the decisions that are being made about them and their family. That is a basic human right. And so we have to literally be able to fight around democracy and fight for voting rights within that same framework. Uh, Lori, a question I'm going to throw in your direction. Can you please talk about the possibility of replacing the Electoral College with the popular vote? Oh, boy, that's outside of vote at homes, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, vote at homes mission for sure. I think I'll just say from because I have to follow up on what Latasha said. Um, we have a solution for that. It's mailing a ballot to every eligible voter across the country. That ultimate, is ultimately our ultimate goal. Um, and to mail that ballot three weeks ahead of time. So voters have lots of opportunity to know the issues, study the issues, um, and, and have plenty of time to vote. And then have many opportunities for returning that ballot, whether it's through uh, postage free, whether it is uh, to a drop box, directly to the voter, to a polling place, to a voter center. Uh, we want to provide all of those options. And then we want ballot tracking. So voters know where their ballot is in the process. They know if a ballot has been potentially, if it's uh, potentially looking at being rejected, they get an immediate notification from the election official, and they have an easy voter-centric method for resolving that challenge. So uh, that is the kind of system that we see as the solution for ensuring that as many people participate as possible. And those states that are using these systems have some of the highest turnout in the country. And so that is something that we are spending at Vote at Home our resources on to ensure that uh, voters across this country are empowered to participate. So you're all women. And I'm wondering if that's a coincidence or whether you think <laughs> that women are absolutely key to the fight to expand voting rights. Gracie, you want to take that first? Yeah, well, I, Jean, I, I so appreciate you naming that because I think that um, in my in my work and in my effort, I have been first, my first organizer was my mother. She's the one that taught me about the ability to, for, and my responsibility to speak up. And so it's not a coincidence. Young people and young women in particular and women on this, um, in this panel have been leading the way for decades and years. And I say that if you find a clear, strong-willed woman around you, follow her wherever you go because she'll know what the next steps are. And so, um, no, it's not a coincidence. And it is our job to ensure that this democracy is open for all of the young women and all of the women all across country. Latasha, your thoughts? Yeah, I think it's because of the nature of the work. What is it that we're fighting against? We're not just fighting against laws. We're fighting against white patriarchy supremacy. That is what we're fighting against. And I think women and communities of color are uniquely impacted by that. And, this, and, and because of that, there's our response. We recognize a part of what is happening right now is really about the consolidation of, of white wealthy power of men. Isn't that in many ways how this country, like a defined democracy, that women were not able to vote, that even the, the, the human rights of other human beings, of our indigenous brothers and sisters, of Asian brothers and sisters, of African Americans, and even white people who didn't own land. The bottom line is if democracy is to happen in America, the way that will happen, the constitution has that right. It will be the we, the people. We are creating the democracy that is laid out in the Declaration of um, Independence. There are elements that exist, but it has not been achieved. And I think women sit squarely at the intersection of sexism and racism, which have literally been, I think, the two greatest barriers to prevent democracy from ever flourishing, evolving, and growing in the way that would lend itself to a representative democracy. I want to leave our, our viewers here today with some practical tips that they can use. Um, and I want each of you to answer this very, very briefly. Lori, if you wanted to give a tip to, the, to somebody out there who wanted to mobilize their community, what would your number one tip be? To connect with your local election office, make sure you know what the rules are for how voters participate in your community, and then do everything you can to make sure that voters uh, have the right information and that they can participate. Grace, your number one tip? Join United We Dream Action in reclaiming our democracy by texting here to stay to 877-877, and then join Latasha wherever she goes. <laughs> okay, Latasha, your number one piece of advice. 
I think we have to shift from seeing ourselves just as citizens of this nation. We have to shift. It's the moment for us to shift and see ourselves as the founders of a new America. And that's going to require us digging in ways that we have not done before. We're going to have to be engaged, all hands on deck. And you can certainly, if you want to know what to do on a day to day, you can certainly follow us, blackvotersmatterfund.org on our website or come get on the Blackest Bus in America as we make democracy in this nation. And we have to leave it there. Latasha Brown, Grace Martinez Rosas, and Lori Agino. Thank you all for joining us here today. So appreciated this conversation. More is ahead. Stay with us.